Hi, and welcome to The Bridge. Thanks so much for tuning in. We are a Markham Community Church located in the greater Toronto area with a passion for helping you engage in an authentic, life-giving community. We would love to connect with you further. Please take a moment and check out our website where you can find more information about our ministry. Well, we hope you're blessed by today's message. Jesus wants to be the treasure of our hearts. He wants to be the unrivaled master that we serve wholeheartedly. It's in our worship that we treasure the infinite value of Jesus, who gave his life for us. In worship, we delight in his goodness. We set our hearts on the beauty of our Savior, who loved us when we were unlovable. When our hearts treasure Jesus through the use of our time, our talents, the way in which we trust, and the things that are temporary, we are reoriented to what is truly priceless. This series will add so much value to the life you're living and so much love to those that you're journeying with. All right, I'm excited to be uh, launching this series this morning and uh, very excited to have some lights. That's awesome. It's great. No, it's a, it's a great series, and I, I believe that we're going to come out of this with a deep appreciation for Jesus. And my sense is, is, that, is that God wants to do something incredibly special in our lives in the way in which we value him in the way in which we value his son. And so uh, there's a, a whole, this whole month is going to be dedicated towards that end, and we, we look forward to what God would do. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we commit this entire month and its services to you. We ask you, Father, to build our understanding of Christ. I pray, Father God, that he would become truly our, our heart's affection and that we would find ourselves so satisfied, that we would find ourselves so fulfilled, as a result, and that we, oh God, in treasuring Jesus, would find the true meaning of life. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Today's sermon is called Foolish Treasures, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to sharing this with you. A long time ago, before there were liberals and conservatives and new Democrats, long before there was the Charter of Rights, or if you're here and you're American, the Bill of Rights, or the Declaration of Independence, there was a place called Rome. Rome. Before, before the end of Rome's worldwide rule, a young man by the name of Octavian rose to prominence. The great Roman statesman and orator Cicero said of Octavian, Octavian is a talented young man who should be praised, honored, and eliminated. In the years after Cicero said that, Octavian destroyed his enemies, including Cicero, transformed Rome into an empire, and assumed the title Caesar Augustus. The empire Caesar Augustus ruled in was huge, from Scotland in the north to Egypt in the south, from Spain in the west to Persia in the east. Augustus had a standing army, army of a half a million men and millions of citizens that he was responsible for who were hungry and needy. So in the 25th year of his reign, he decided to raise taxes and required a census of the entire empire. When Augustus issued his decree for the census, there was a Jewish couple that had to migrate south from their home in Galilee to Bethlehem in Judea, where the wife, Mary, gave birth to an infant son whose name was Jesus. When that decree was issued, everyone knew who Caesar was, and no one knew who Jesus was. Now, more than 2,000 years later, Few outside of history departments or colleges or universities know who Augustus is or was. Jesus, however, is worshipped by billions around the world. And one of the main reasons that this happened was because the early church eventually infiltrated and then over time displaced the Roman Empire. It did so because those first Christians had the Holy Spirit living within them. And they had Jesus' example to guide them. 
They lived out the truth of what Jesus taught, like what's recorded in Luke chapter 12. And I want to take you to Luke chapter 12, where Jesus is teaching, but he ends up being interrupted by someone. Luke says that Jesus was preaching to a huge multitude, a crowd of many thousands. And Jesus was talking to the crowd about issues like heaven and hell, judgment and forgiveness, fear and faithfulness. Jesus was unfolding the values of heaven in an earthly context. He was presenting the kingdom of God. In the middle of Jesus' message, a man elbows his way to the front of the crowd, just like people do when they want to see a celebrity, when they want to shake a hand of somebody who's popular. This guy elbows his way to the front of the crowd and has an agenda to promote. He interrupted Jesus and this kingdom message, where literally he is opening people's hearts and minds to to a whole new level of what it is that's truly important. And this guy interrupts Jesus. And we see in verse 13 what it is that he interrupts Jesus to talk about. This is what it says in verse 13 of Luke 12. Someone in the crowd said to him, meaning Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replies to this man and says, Who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Now, I love this about Jesus because he knows his mission. He knows his purpose. He doesn't get lost. Even though people may have an apparent need, he doesn't get lost as to why he's there. He is opening up a whole new world of consideration for people, and someone comes to him, and says, I need you to arbitrate over the inheritance of my father with me and my brother. And Jesus looks at him and says, wait a minute, you're missing the whole, this is, I'm not here for that. I'm not here for that. And then it says, he said to them, who's them? To the disciples and to the, all those who were within, within earshot. He says, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. It's not by accident that this man makes his way up to the front while Jesus is talking about kingdom values and kingdom principles, a way of living that, that is consistent with heaven's agenda. And he speaks to the issue of greed and the issue of how we relate to the abundance of our possessions. For the man, the sun would never shine, flowers would never bloom, and the birds would never sing until he got his stuff from his brother. That, that was his main thought. In ancient times, the firstborn was guaranteed a double portion of the family inheritance. And more than likely, the brother who was addressing Jesus maybe saw in Jesus the hope of changing this ancient tradition. This person who seems to speak with authority might have something to say about what I'm concerned with most right now. And Jesus warns this person about his covetousness, about his greed. And Jesus warns, and he says to all who are within earshot, that our lives are not to be about gathering wealth. Life is so much more than the abundance of our possessions. It's one of the values of the kingdom. Now, I know that most of us don't like to think that Jesus ever got upset with people except those those. Sadducees and those Pharisees, but the language of this particular verse in the original language is incredibly intense, and the tone is one of a rebuke. Jesus is rebuking this man. And Jesus was upset because he knew that the man was in a bad place. From Jesus' perspective, the man was caught up in a destructive sin that was crippling the man morally and spiritually. 
The man was standing right in front of the Son of God. But all the man could think about was his material wherewithal, his stuff. And Jesus turns to those who are close by, and I'm assuming those close by were the disciples and the crowd close enough to hear, and he names the sin, and the name that he gives the sin is greed. Greed. What is greed? Well, greed is often defined as the excess desire to have more and more of what you already have enough of. One writer defines greed this way. Greed is the assumption that, that it's all there, all there for my consumption. Greed is approaching the buffet table hungry when you're already full. With no thought for those around you who are also approaching the buffet table with empty stomachs and experiencing true hunger. Maybe a more simple definition of greed is an intense, distracting desire for more. Now, most of us never think of ourselves as greedy. I don't think that I'm greedy. And I would bet that you don't think that you see yourself as greedy either. But given what Jesus says in the passage, would it be wise for you and I to do some self-examination and some, some spiritual inventory? Is it possible that all of us might be more influenced by the spirit of greed than we might be willing to admit? Let me give you something to meditate on for just a moment. Did you know that in the 1970s, there were very, very few storage units in North America? But now there are more storage units than all the McDonald's, Subways, and Starbucks combined. There are far more storage units in North America than there are post offices. There are 10,000 storage units internationally throughout the world, and there are 60,000 storage units in North America right now. And it generates $24 billion a year in revenue. Storage. Now, most of us in this room, we have a lot of stuff. Does that mean that we're greedy? Well, what I've observed over the years is that most of us in the church world think only rich people are greedy. Now, there's an element of that kind of thinking that's spread into our popular culture as well. But it misrepresents the overall teaching of scriptures. The Bible never teaches that riches and wealth in and of themselves are wrong. By the standards of their era and their culture, Abraham, Job, David, Solomon, they were incredibly wealthy, and they were deeply spiritual people, very close to the heart of God. And throughout church history, numerous wealthy people used their their physical and their material resources to advance the work of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Two of the godliest men that I personally know are incredibly affluent, but very invested in the advancement of God's kingdom. And I don't think God is opposed to people making money and earning money. But for every verse in the Bible that speaks about prosperity, there are ten more that warn us about covetousness and about greed. Rich people are not the only ones who need to pay attention to this reality. So there's no indication in this passage that the man who interrupted Jesus is rich, but it's clear that he's greedy. That means we should all do well to do a little self-evaluation and some spiritual inventory because greed is rooted in the silly idea that if I just have more and more stuff, my life will be better better. The mentality is dangerous because it can blind us to the eternal things that God considers to be the most valuable things. Jesus knew that, he just knew this, so he, to reinforce it, he decides to tell a story within the story. He tells a parable or a story within the story about the man who interrupts him. 
And this is what he says. He tells them this parable. And he says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And this man thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Well, we don't know the name of that rich farmer, but it's obvious that he was incredibly successful. It doesn't matter what industry or occupation you're in, you don't become that successful unless you work hard and are pretty visionary in your thinking. If the farmer had lived in our high-tech, computer-driven culture, Jesus might have described the man as a software genius. The farmer comes up with this brilliant idea, got some venture capital put together for his company, put in long hours developing and creatively marketing this product. Before he realizes it, we're at 30% a year and still growing. Wall Street loves this firm, and the company's stock soars and splits and then soars and splits some more. Since things were going so well, he decides to expand his company's business by developing some new products and then targeting some new markets, both locally and globally. He was making so much money, he couldn't fill his mutual fund opportunities and his investment portfolio fast enough. That's how much money he was making. So let's pause for just a moment and take a look at what this man was treasuring, what he was seeing as priorities or values. First of all, harvesting large crops. We see that. Building a successful career. Secondly, building bigger barns, expanding the business. Thirdly, achieving financial security, having at least a million dollars or more in the bank. And then, eating whatever he wants, drinking whatever he wants, being merry all the time. Now, I know some of you people, and myself too, might think, Brian, I'm not sure there's anything wrong with this picture. After all, the guy's sharp. He's working hard. Things are really going well. And at one level, I want to agree with you. From one angle, things were going exceptionally well for the man until one night, it all changes. And Jesus says that the man was foolish because the man was poor towards God. This is what he says, but God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Hmm. So let me translate this into our context. Late one evening, after kissing his wife goodnight, the man went up to his study because his mind was racing and he couldn't sleep. He wanted to review the new business plan for the coming year. Suddenly, without any warning, he feels this sharp pain in his chest. All those years of stress, too much meat, and too many cigars caught up with him. His arteries have hardened. The blood couldn't get through, and his heart skips a beat, then an another, and then it shuts down. And they find him in the morning, and he's dead at his desk. At his funeral, everyone in the neighborhood and the community talked about how successful he was. People remarked about his work ethic, reminisced about his marketing genius and how what a visionary he was. They took his casket out to the gravesite. They buried it, and they put up the gravestone with the dates of his life and a statement about how successful, hardworking, and visionary he was, and then everybody went home. That night, the angel of the Lord shows up and writes one word across his tombstone. In the Greek, the word is aphron, and it means fool. Or stupid. Jesus doesn't call the man evil or wicked or horrible. He calls him foolish 
or stupid. Because his life was built on the foolish idea that if he had just more stuff, all would be good. That seemed to be working for a while, but then the man made one huge mistake. He died. He died. Have you seen the latest statistics on death? Incredibly frightening. When we die, we leave everything behind. Everything. Jesus tells this story to make a very important point about stuff. He says, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards the things of God. Christian writer and philosopher Dallas Willard said that Jesus is the smartest guy who ever lived. And one of the main reasons that that's true is because Jesus always directs us away from what would harm us and towards what is best for us. Jesus does this because he loves us, and that's exactly what he's doing here. He points us to God and reflects God's values, his idea of treasure. God calls us to center our lives around the kingdom. Going on with the text in chapter 12, it says in verse 22, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear, for life is more than food. And the body is for more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. See, Jesus makes this statement at the end of this beautiful picture of God's provision, and he lets us know that the way in which we're relating to the material world, to the temporal world, is the way in which he measures our faith. It's the way in which he measures our faith, the way in which you and I are relating to things material. With that last statement, Jesus is letting us know that the true test or measure of our faith is how we relate to our material things. And Jesus simply tells us that our Father will care for us. He'll provide. And since he'll provide, we should center our lives in and around the things that he cares about, the things that he values, the things that are eternal and everlasting in nature. So let's be clear. Jesus isn't, isn't against clothes. He's not against cars or computers or any of the other things that we use on a daily basis. He's not saying don't ever think about money. Don't go out to dinner. Don't buy new furniture. He's not saying, look, don't save for retirement and don't go on a family vacation. He's not saying that. Jesus is not saying it's God first, family second, job third, Church fourth and money and possessions fifth. That's not what he's saying. He's telling us that life is like a wheel and at the very hub and center of the wheel should be Jesus as our treasure. For wherever your treasure is, there is your heart also. And, and what, what Jesus is saying is, is that my father and I can measure your faith and the affection of your heart in the way in which you're relating to the material world that you're living in. So I'm showing a wheel here with God at the center, or with Jesus as the treasure at the center of your heart. That's what self is, you. Jesus at the center. And if this is true, then that impacts everything around you, your family, 
It impacts your, your sense of fulfillment. It impacts your idea of fun. It impacts the issue of finances, and it impacts facilities. What do I mean by facilities? Facilities defined as a place, an amenity, or a piece of equipment provided for a particular purpose. This building, this property is a facility. The question is, are we using it in order to show the world around us that we treasure Jesus above and beyond everything else? As we live with God at the center, his power and presence will flow out of us into the areas of our family, our friends, our sense of fulfillment, our fun, and the way in which we use our facilities or our material goods. We have Jesus' heart and mind on such matters. As we center our lives more in Christ, we'll automatically live out one of the core values of the kingdom, the value that is generosity. So again, Jesus continues on. He's continuing to teach the same crowd of people. And he says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. So sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. You see, there's a reason that the early church overtook Rome. There's a, there's a reason that Christianity became the faith by 400 A.D. There's a reason. It's the, the, church, the early church was incredibly generous with its time, with its energy, with its talents, and with its temporal treasures and material resources. The church knew what Jesus had done for them, and they knew the life standard that he had set before them where he was willing to take everything that was physical in nature and surrender it for spiritual purposes. This early church shared their resources inside and outside of the church. They used their resources to make disciples, to baptize them, and teach them all that Jesus had taught them. They used their resources to help the needy and take care of the orphans and the widows and tend to the sick and the broken. And as they did that, they won more and more people to, be, to give their faith in Jesus. Last week's baptism service, by the way, we all left here so happy. We all left here so excited. Why? Why were we so excited? Why did we walk away? Everyone was saying, that was amazing. Because we all know that this is what life is really all about. What we experienced last week, hearing people talk about the life-transforming relationship that they have with Jesus, is why we exist. It's our reason for being, not just as a church, but as people. And we all walked out of here knowing that God is on the throne. And that while we live in a wild and woolly world, there are people whose eyes are opening and people whose ears are opening. And they're seeing Jesus as the answer to their need. In the early 4th century, when faith in Jesus was absolutely everywhere, there was an emperor who came to power, and he was known as Julian the Apostate. He hated Christianity and wanted to revert back to the empire of paganism. And that goal was nearly impossible to establish or to accomplish because by that time, the church was so widespread, so generous, that it was touching most people in the universe or in the empire. At one point, Julian became so frustrated that in a rare moment of honesty, he said this, he said, those Christians not only feed their own poor, but they feed ours as well. The early church realized that storing up stuff on earth is silly because it gets left behind. So they centered their lives in God's kingdom and gave generously to all who had a need. How did they do this? How did they do this? Well, number one, they held the things of this world lightly, and, they, and those things of the next world, they clung to dearly. In Giving It All Away, David Green relates a story about Bob Hoskins, who was a missionary pioneer with his son, 
Rob in Beirut, Lebanon. And Bob tells the story of, of how twice in his career path in Lebanon, he was immediately removed from his home and everything that he owned. And he was brought back to the United States for a three month period. The first time this happened, he had a tremendous fear as to what was going to happen to everything that he owned. And when he returned back to his place, his home in Lebanon, he found that everything was preserved and kept and there was a sense of relief. Just two years later, the same thing happened again and he was removed from Lebanon for safety reasons, brought back to the United States. Three months later, he goes back hoping for the same result only to find that everything he had ever owned was gone. He had nothing. And this is what he concluded. He said, hold the things of this world very lightly. They may be there for you to enjoy tomorrow, or they may not. The Bible says we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. So live with an open hand towards God. It's the only way in a dangerous and unpredictable world to be secure. It's the only way. What else did they do? They identified themselves in Christ the giver, not in the things that he generously gives. To identify with Jesus is to see him as our supply, our security, and our significance. I read recently about a guy whose whole world was wrapped up in his Harley Davidson motorcycle. One day he found that he had a rabid form of cancer and had but days left to live. And he immediately spent a small fortune arranging his burial. He bought a double plot so that he could have his Harley buried right next to him with a tombstone with a picture of his Harley Davidson, Davidson on the tombstone. I'm thinking if that angel were to come by, he might write across it, foolish. Jesus reminds us in Scripture to not let the joy of the gift distract us from the joy of the giver. And he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do, vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What else was true about the New Testament church? What else was true is that they had eyes for the true treasures that God gives. I read recently about the discovery of an original painting by a Renaissance artist, Raphael, in the estate in Scotland. It was originally thought to be a fake, and so the painting was credited as a copy for years. And it was valued at $26 in 1899, somewhere around $2,600 today. The painting caught the eye of an expert guy by the name of Dr. Benoit Grosner during the filming of a BBC television commercial or television series. While he was looking at other artwork, he happened to glance, just glance at this piece of art worth $26. And he looked at it and he said, by crikey, it looks like a Raphael. And Grosfer took that piece of art, had it evaluated, and it now sits in the museum in Scotland worth $26 million. Somebody had the eyes to see the true value of the treasure. In the eyes of Grossner, that which was disregarded or treated as virtually worse, worthless became incredibly value, valuable. Jesus speaks to this in Matthew where he says, For this people's heart has grown callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are you, when you and your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. One of the things I learned about greed is it's one of the things that blinds us without us even knowing that we're blinded. Most of us would not see ourselves as greedy or covetous. And yet, it's one of the sins that is pervasive even in the church of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is challenging us and saying, watch out. Have your eyes open. Have your ears open for the truth of really what is going on in your life. 
And Jesus is saying that true treasures and true spirituality is in seeing the things that are truly eternal in importance and being willing to release the things that are temporal and that are physical. Last point. The thing that the early church did that turned the world upside down was that everyone was willing to use and honor God, God with whom God had created them to be. In other words, there was a truth that came upon everyone, and the truth was this, that God has given me personal resources, abilities, my personality, my giftedness, my experiences. It all adds up to God giving me gifts to be used in the world to draw people to a better understanding of God's love for them. I love what, what was said in an MIT speech by Drew Houston, the founder of Dropbox. This is what he said. When I think about it, the happiest and most successful people that I know don't just love what they do, they're obsessed with solving an important problem, something that really matters to them. They remind me of a dog chasing a tennis ball. Their eyes go a little crazy, the leash snaps, and they go bounding off, plowing through whatever gets in their way. So it's not about pushing yourself. It's about finding your tennis ball, the thing that pulls you. So what is your tennis ball? God and his creative intent is the tennis ball. Jesus is your treasure, and you can't be truly happy or fulfilled until you see this. This is why Jesus was agitated when the man elbowed his way to the front to see him and interrupted his talk on the kingdom lesson because the guy only wanted to talk about his stuff. Can you just feel the disappointment in Jesus? Really? Is this the measure of your faith, sir? Is this the measure of your faith? Is this what your understanding of life, is this what it's all about? O oh, Hugh of little faith. So Father, we come before you as a congregation. And we don't want to be found wanting. We want to have the kind of faith that relates to material things properly. We want to have the kind of faith where we trust you implicitly, knowing that there is no good thing that you would ever withhold from us. And knowing that, we're so secure and we're so full. We're not hungry. We're not hungry in the sense that we have needs, for we have you who supplies every need. And we have your church that shares so generously to supply. And we thank you for that. But Jesus, please find us distracted with something altogether far more important, and that is your kingdom agenda. Please find us as a people absolutely hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Please find us as a people who are absolutely attracted to and in love with Jesus. His values, his way of being, and help us to follow him and to honor him with our very lives and with the way in which we relate to our material things. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.